Thank you for tuning in to a sermon from Redemption Hill Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us. It's our prayer that this will lift your heart and encourage you, set your eyes more fully on Jesus as we open God's word together. You can join us anytime in person or online in our live stream. You can find that at redemptionhilldc.org. If you're not in D.C., we encourage you to get involved in a local church where you live for the sake of encouragement and accountability in a local body, but we're also glad to have you join us and, and walk through this study with us. If you'd like to support the Ministries of Redemption Hill, you can do so at our website, again, redemptionhilldc.org. Um, tonight we are continuing, we just started a series last week, and we're continuing it tonight, um, and it is introducing a new initiative for Redemption Hill Church, and so we're walking through this in a five or six week series to introduce things this week to, and so um, it's called Dwell, an Enduring and Faithful Presence, looking at what we are hoping for as a church and what we're headed toward as a church. Um, we handed out these booklets last week. If you are, if you don't have a booklet and you would like one, or if you call Redemption Hill home and you don't have one yet, then certainly you can put your hand up. Pastor Eric has some, and if you put your hand up, he'll come around and get one to you. Um, if you mention it to him, we also have pens, and so he can run back and grab you a pen as well. Um, so in these books, you will find, it, by the way, if you're new to Redemption Hill and you're stepping in and you're going, what is this series? <clears throat> this is actually a great time to get to know us, get to know our church and where we're headed and where we feel like God is calling us. Um, and if you're new to the church, then you are welcome to be a participant or simply to join us and, and watch as we walk through this next several weeks. And so in the book, if, you have, if you're just receiving one, um, as you turn, actually it's at the midway point where the staples are, so it's really easy to find the sermon notes for tonight. Um, in the back of the book, there are, there's a place for sermon notes that includes a pass, the passage we're going to study for a given night, some, a place to take notes, and then there's um, questions for your own reflection and review and some guidance on how to pray in the coming week. And so um, that is a resource for you. The other thing that is there in the back of it that we are asking those who are members and regular attenders of Redemption Hill, again, if you call this home to join us in, is there's a commitment card. And last week we asked, I'm going to continue this week, we asked you if this is your church home to put this in a place where you'll be reminded to pray and prayerfully consider how God might work in you as you consider what he might call you to do. Now, tonight we're going to be in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Before we get to that, though, I also want to just mention um, every year it's a practice that I have on, um, on MLK Day to read Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. If you haven't read that, I would highly encourage you, <clears throat> if you just type in a search for that on Google, it will bring up... Any, any copy you want of it, but to read that and think about the things that Dr. King had to say. If you have read it, then I encourage you to revisit it. Um, it's, it continues to resound as a powerful call through today. All right, let's pray, and we're going to step into our text for the evening. Father, coming together tonight, we thank you and praise you for who you are, for your love for us, for the good gifts that you give us. Lord, we thank you that, that you call all people to yourself without partiality. And thank you that Christ is the Savior for all. So we, as we think about your work in Redemption Hill and our desire to reach and reflect our city, our desire to, to be able to communicate the dignity and worth that the people of this place have because they bear your image and likeness. And we pray that you would stir our hearts as we think about what it is to dwell in this place and to be an enduring and faithful presence. Would you continue to shape this church and mold it as you will? And so tonight we lift our time to you. We lift our hearts to you as we open your word and ask you to speak to us. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, church, tonight we begin the next four weeks, including tonight, we are in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. So if you have a Bible, you can open it up there. It will also, again, if you turn to that, to the second sermon in the series in the booklet, you will find the passage there, and it will also be on the screen for you. And these two chapters are the most extended teaching in the New Testament that we have about money. And so, we're going to talk about it. 
This, is, this can be an uncomfortable topic. Can I admit, as your pastor, I've been nervous about this part. Um, I don't really like talking about it. And I'm nervous about it, and I think there's reason to be nervous about it, because we see all kinds of misuses of money and ways that, that it goes bad. And so for me, I'm like, man, I'm going to stand up in, in front of the church. And in the meantime, like, uh, you think instantly, for me at least, what comes to mind is like pastors asking for their own private jet. That's not this. <laughs> Or if you've ever seen the, the Instagram handle, Preachers and Sneakers, um, it's not that either. I mean, I've just got Chuck Taylors on tonight, so <laughs> I'm not very Instagram worthy, I don't think. But there are cases of abuse uh, in, in ministries and in, in, in churches, and it can be personally touchy to talk about money, but as it's, it's been a, sp- a spot within Redemption Hill that I think I've probably, and not that we've avoided entirely, every week we give a couple of minutes or a minute uh, that we're going into our giving that talks about generosity, but we haven't spent any extended time talking about how we use our money. And so we're going to do that over the next few weeks. These chapters are really helpful for us, and they'll help us to understand a biblical perspective on generosity, including finances, but not limited to that, because bi- biblical generosity is more about our hearts than anything else. What God wants from us, what Jesus wants from us, is our hearts. And, and so we need to understand that and that understand that like strict percentages or understanding an amount actually misses the heart of the connection between the old and new covenants and the heart of what it means to be God's people. And so as Paul planted the church in Corinth, he spent 18 months, about a year and a half, in Corinth, in that city, which was an ancient, like it was a major shipping port, a very wealthy city, and Paul spent a year and a half there planting this church, and we have two of the letters that he wrote to the Corinthian church, and it addresses all kinds of issues that are practical in the church and that churches still face today, including ours. And so we have two of those letters, which there were at least three written, there were probably more written, but Paul in 2 Corinthians, this is one of my favorite things, because people, are, there's always, you know, theologians ask the question, like, what if we found the other letter to the Corinthians? Well, we're 2,000 years out. I don't think that's likely. But I also don't think it's likely because in 2 Corinthians, Paul refers to a tearful letter. Now, he's got some hard things to say to the church in the two letters we have. And so I'm not surprised that if there was one that was even harder on the church, that they were like, you know, maybe this isn't going to last for all time. <laughs> and we're just going to let this one hit the fireplace. Uh, but these are the two letters that we have from the apostle. And, um, and it, he shows us here, he's careful to avoid a transactional approach of faith, but it's, he proclaims, as he does everywhere, the gospel of God and the grace of Jesus Christ. And he, he shows us here that following Jesus is about our whole self, all of life. And that is what Christ calls us into, and that has implications for generosity. So that's why we're looking today at the, at the Macedonian church, these, these believers that Paul holds up as an example of what it means to give ourselves first to the Lord. And so that's what we're headed into. Um, and as, as the context of what's happening here, just to let you know, because it, it shapes how we understand the text, is that Paul, in the churches he planted, was going around and sending Titus and others around to take up a collection, and offering for the church in Jerusalem, because the church in Jerusalem was persecuted and was struggling. And, and there's background to this, too. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about when he went to Jerusalem, and he says that he met with Peter and James and John to lay out the gospel, to make sure they were on the same page, and that they, he brought Titus with him, actually, to, to, to have, get into a discussion about circumcision and whether the old covenant law continues through into the new covenant, the gospel in Christ. And so he met with the pillars of the early church, Peter, James, and John, and they agreed that Peter would be the apostle to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. But it says in Galatians 2 that the only thing they urged him to do was to remember the poor, the very thing which he was eager to do. Now that could mean all poor across the world, but it, I think it's more likely in the context there that they're talking about the Jerusalem church. To say that's fine, as the gospel advances, just don't forget where it started because it's not easy here right now. And so Paul was fulfilling that commitment as he went around to these churches that he had started later on and said that he's taking up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem. And so that is the, what is the background for the encouragement we're about to read to the church in Corinth in chapter 8, and this is what we see. <clears throat> we want you to know, brothers or brothers and sisters, 
about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so as we approach this text, as we approach the idea of giving and generosity and money, there's two real angles that I think we, we see Christians come at this discussion from. One is the question, do Christians have to tithe? Very practical and pragmatic. That's, that's an impor- in, it's an interesting question, but I don't think it's the most important one. I think it's better to, to ask, how do these two chapters fit into the background of these epistles, and what does it encourage us toward? Now, in 1 Corinthians 9, we see that in, in the previous letter that Paul was actually financially supported by the church in Macedonia, but re- refused any money from the Corinthians because he said to them that he didn't want it to be transactional. So he said, listen, I didn't take any money from you, but he was supported by these Macedonians, now who he's saying actually have much less materially than the Corinthians did. And so there's, I want to re- remind you here, too, that when you think about tithing and giving, there is only one passage in the entire New Testament that mentions tithing explicitly. It's when Jesus was talking to Pharisees, and he said to them, hey, you tithe everything. You tithe even your herbs, your mint, and your cumin, but you've missed the heartbeat of God. And so there, he's saying to them, you're doing this, and you're so precise on the legalistic and the the law aspect of things that you're even tithing your herbs, which I don't know about you. I've never done that. I've never heard of anybody tithing their herbs. None have shown up in our offering plates or baskets. I think in the baskets, they'd actually just like sift through, which would be awkward. But that's like that kind of precision probably isn't part of our lives. And actually, when it comes to the idea of tithing, if you really want to go back and read about the rounds of giving of the first fruits in the Old Covenant, the 10% was just one round. It ended up being over 30% along the way. And so, I mean, if you want to tithe 30% to the Redemption Hill, I'm not going to say no, but that isn't, I don't think, realistic or helpful. And it's not what's required here. Now, and so what we're going to look at, again, is this Macedonian model to give ourselves first to the Lord. And there's four characteristics that Paul lists here of what it looks like to give ourselves first to the Lord. The first one is generosity in all circumstances. You've got to love this because the church in Macedonia had, it didn't have things easy. I mean, he says right off the bat, we want you to know about this, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. These were Paul's financial supporters, remember, for his ministry. But he says it was a severe test of affliction that their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty. Now, you might, <laughs> I might expect to read there, like, they, these believers in Christ had an abundance of joy and extreme poverty, and so they gave what they could, they prayed earnestly. But it, what Paul goes on is he says, the abundance of joy and their extreme poverty, they have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on, on, the, on their part. They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And so the Macedonians provide a model for us first by showing generosity in all circumstances. And so even as they're supporting Paul's ministry, now they begged him for the chance to support the church in Jerusalem as well. I don't think this is usually our response to hitting hard patches financially. Now, I don't know about you and your personal finances, but just hypothetically, people often are a little overextended this time of year. 
You go through the holidays, maybe you traveled, maybe you gave some gifts. Um, in our family, we had lots of people that wanted to give lots of gifts. And so you get to January, and oftentimes people look at, at bank statements or credit card bills and go, oh no, like how, what have we done? And so it's a time of year that people usually will try to tighten up. And you know you've got to have some stretches where you tighten up in what you're doing. And so that is the time of year that we are running an initiative to ask you to commit to Redemption Hill Church. But it, it, what we see here is that even in a time when things were tight, the Macedonian believers extended themselves. And this resonates now today. And the American church study after study shows that those who are poor give proportionally more than the rich. And so that's reflected here by the Macedonians. Now, Paul isn't like extracting and taking advantage of them. It was, it was of their own decision, but, but they're a model for us. Jesus talked about this too. In Luke chapter 21, he was teaching the religious leaders and, and, so, and they were challenging him on some things and he had, he had cleansed the temple and flipped tables over and so they were, he wasn't super popular at this point and he had just given a warning about the religious, the scribes and the Pharisees and people who walk around and, and show off their religious status and, and then he looked up, it says, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty all that she has to live on. Now, this goes against any advice that you'd get from any financial advisor. You wouldn't see business plans that are built this way. And why in the world would we give, would anybody give, in, in, in the midst of difficult circumstances? Well, Paul gives us the reason right here. He says, I want you to know about the grace of God that has been given among these churches. That it's out of grace that they've received a gift of God and their joy has overflowed. In Greek, those three words are closely related. The word grace is charis. The word gift is charisma. And the word joy is kara. And there's a connection to them linguistically, and, and it, so it flows here, as Paul wrote this, that it is the, found, found, the foundation of God's charis, his grace, that gave a gift of joy to these people, and that is the reason they were able to be generous in all circumstances. You can see this in your own life, you can see it in lives around you, that there is often an inverse relationship between our fixation on money and, and financial security and our joy. But when we're generous, with people, when we give things away and we see people receive them and we see people have joy come to them for, from our generosity, think about what that does for your heart. This is one of the best things about being a dad on Christmas morning, um, especially when my kids were smaller, but even now there's a magic to Christmas morning and watching somebody when you've anticipated something, had something, and watching the joy that it brings somebody being generous is something that, that does, it changes your heart. The problem is, though, that our hearts get insatiable, and that's why we get tied to money. There's something that we're all longing to have filled. There's, all, every one of us is chasing after some kind of purpose and joy and satisfaction and happiness and comfort, but we're like Bono. We still haven't found what we're looking for. And as Passenger, another artist, saying, he said, well, you only need the light when it's burning low. Only miss the sun when it starts to snow. Only know you love her when you let her go. Only know you've been high when you're feeling low. Only hate the road when you're missing home. Only know you love her when you let her go. And then it's heartbreaking. The next line in the song is, and you've let her go. But this is so often true for us. In our hearts, we take things for granted. We take people for granted. We, we don't enjoy things to the fullest until there's, there's a threat that they're taken from us or they are taken from us. And so if we, we, what I want us to be able to capture here and understand is that, that the call that the Scripture has to us, if you're a follower of Jesus, is to give ourselves first to the Lord and to be generous in any circumstance, knowing that even when things are hard, that it might be better for us because when we reach a point that Jesus is all we have, then we realize that he is all we need, and that's when we can actually find deep joy and rest and give ourselves first to the Lord. But that takes discipline, and that's the second characteristic of the Macedonian church. Generosity in all circumstances, and generosity as discipline. 
If you're a grammar nerd, the prepositions tonight are going to kind of drive things. So generosity is discipline. This is the nature of generosity. We will never accidentally become generous. And, and Paul says here, this was uh, uh, according to their own means. They had planned these things. They had stored up these things. They provided this. And then they wanted to go beyond it. But again, this was not... This was not forced or coerced. This was earnest. They were begging Paul for the opportunity to take part in this relief of the saints in Jerusalem. And generosity for us is something that is a discipline. And, and it is a discipline because none of us accidentally stumbles into generosity. None of us accidentally lives self-sacrificially, giving things up for others. It's something that we have to work on, like any other discipline. I mean, we're right now, 15 years into the new year, right? It's a time of year that a lot of people make new spiritual disciplines and commitments, and so Bible reading plans, and I'm not going to ask it for a show of hands of how many of you have already fallen off the tracks 15 days in. I'll be honest with you as your pastor, maybe this isn't something that I should say, like, I think I've maybe done the read through the whole Bible in one year thing, like, once or twice. It's not usually the way that I and digest scripture and engage in that. Um, and so that's not even something I've been able to maintain every year. But it, it takes discipline, and that doesn't release us from, like, get back on, on the tracks and keep going with it because it, getting yourself into God's word is one of the primary ways to nourish your soul. But it's discipline. You don't accidentally say, you know what I'm going to do today is I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read Leviticus. Like, that, that takes focus. You, probably don't, you don't, probably don't fall into just praying and making prayer an intimate part of your life and relationship with God. It takes discipline. This is true of other areas of our lives, that, that being physically fit takes discipline for most of us. I'm convinced that for some of you, it doesn't take any work. But watching, like right now it's the NFL playoffs. It's one of the most wonderful times of the year that my team is never part of. But it's incredible to see the athletes, the body control, the strength, the speed. But players don't get to that level without incredible discipline and work ethic. And often what separates those who are good from those who are the greatest is that work ethic, the obsessive discipline at their craft. This is, school for, this is true for work. It's true for school that it takes discipline to get your work done. It's true for our emotions. It's true for relationships. And so here, generosity also takes discipline. And, and here, he, what he says about the Macedonians is that they were begging to be a part of this, and not as they expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And so they're building up the, the ministry of the apostles, but they, are, they gave themselves first to the Lord. And that's the most astounding thing here, that it wasn't just financial. There was something that, that Paul was recognizing as evidence of God's grace that was showing up in the lives of these believers that he's calling the Corinthian church then to say, look at this. This is a model for us to be able to pursue and consider. And, and so, and so this, is, this is something we need to see, that there's a discipline here, but also giving ourselves first to the Lord. And that includes financial generosity, but it's not limited to that. At Redemption Hill, we talk about our members are asked to commit to the church with time, talent, and treasure in ways that are sacrificial, joyful, and generous. And so we're asked, like, we want to see you use your gifts for, God, for the good of the church and, and the advancement of the gospel. But there's a question there of, it is possible for us to give and to contribute without giving ourselves first to the Lord. Charles Spurgeon, the preacher, said this was the best donation even better than the two mites of the poor widow. She gave her living, but they gave their life, their very being. They also gave the best donation in the best way. They didn't stop with giving themselves to the Lord. They also gave themselves to the Lord's people. This is the will of God, that those who yield themselves up to him should join those who are his already. But like anything, it takes discipline, it takes work, and as you work those muscles of generosity, they get stronger. And so... Giving ourselves first to the Lord looks like generosity in all circumstances, generosity as a discipline, and then generos generosity for the completion of grace. Now, this language is, is interesting to me here, too. That, so Titus comes. So we urge Titus that he should start. He should com complete this among you. Complete among you this act of grace. 
It's, he's saying there's, there's something still lacking here. It hasn't been brought to its fullness, its maturity, that God's grace has, has come up within the Corinthian believers, but he's saying that there's a completion and a fullness that is still coming for it, a perfection to that grace as it worked itself out in them. Now, if you read through the, letter, the, the first letter of the Corinthians, you see all kinds of focus that this church had on gifts. Like, they were obsessed with spiritual gifts. And 1 Corinthians 11 to 14 is the most extended section we have in Scripture about the church and spiritual gifts. And so where Paul says, listen, there's one spirit and many gifts that he chooses to give out. There's one body of Christ and many members of it, and we're all different parts of the body contributing to the body. But he then goes on to say like, they, they were clearly out of control in some of their use of the spiritual gifts and their perspectives on spiritual gifts. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said to them, he said, listen, you might have the tongues of men and angels, but without love, you're just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You might have knowledge to understand and fathom all mysteries. You might give up everything you have for the poor or give yourself up to the flames, but without love, you're nothing. That love is the one gift that God gives every one of us. And whatever flows from that is as the Spirit leads and guides in our lives. But it's love that consumes us as the love of Christ consumes us. And so here he brings that back around and he says to the church, he says, you excel in everything. Now, you can, I, for me, as I imagine, like these letters were originally like publicly read, so they would have been carried to a place probably by Titus in this case. So Paul's giving an endorsement to Titus and they were carried to it and then they would gather the church in Corinth together like we're sitting here now and open the, up the letter from the apostle and read it. So you can almost picture here, he's saying like, hey, think about these Macedonian believers and the Corinthians going, okay, I feel like we can see where you're going with this, Paul. And then he goes, but you, you excel in everything. And the church going, yeah. You excel in speech, are in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness. Yes, Paul, go on. <laughs> and you excel in our love for you. He kind of flips it there. <laughs> You're so lucky that we love you. See that you excel in this act of grace also. So what he's saying is, as Don Carson, the theologian, said, it is possible for Christians to luxuriate in certain gifts and neglect others, hindering their maturity. That generosity is a spiritual act springing from faith and trust carried by the Spirit through us as evidence of God's grace. He's saying you excel in all these things and now want to see them become complete. It makes me think about what are the things that as I look as your pastor at Redemption Hill, what have we excelled in and where, what are things that we need that we want to be able to excel in as, as God's grace is completed in us? I think as a church, we've excelled in some of the things that we, that we talk about a lot and that we focus on. So we, I think we've excelled in gospel centrality and our worship as we sing and hear God's word and pray together and gather together. And I think we've excelled in the gospel shaping our community as people care for each other and, and, and we see the impact of the gospel and God's grace in the way that people walk alongside each other. I think we've excelled in the, in, at times in the work that our church is doing in our city. And involved in getting involved with other organizations, caring for people, and, and, and seeing people come to Christ. I think we've definitely excelled in hospitality. That's one of the first things we ask people as they come into our membership classes, like, what is it that drew you to Redemption Hill? And often the, one of the first things we hear, or one of the top things we hear is, you know, it's, I was warmly welcomed. I got invited to like three community groups within the first couple of times I came. And we see that in the way that people care for each other on the bulletin board. Like, that is, the church bulletin board on CCB is incredible to me, where people, like, whenever we've put up a need on the bulletin board, it feels like it's met within 30 seconds, and then I keep getting emails. And so the way that people rally around each other and care for each other, the way that community groups come together and care for our city is great. Where have we fallen behind? Well, yeah, I mean, what are the areas that we haven't, necessarily given ourselves first to the Lord as a collective. I think there's a couple of things. 
it's for me. We've excelled in some areas of, we've, we talk about one of our core values is uni unity and diversity or oneness without sameness. We've excelled when it comes to politically, uh, ideological diversity politically. And that's been a real strength of Redemption Hill. We have people from all over the country and all over the world. We don't yet see the ethnic diversity that reflects our city as we say that we want to reach and reflect DC. And that's an area where we continue to seek God's leading and want to grow in. I think too about just our engagement. We, we had some things going on before early 2020 and something happened in March of that year. And so for the last few years, we've been trying to sort out what life looks like. And, and there's a reality that for our church, it's, it's changed some things. And so I think there's a life cycle in, in a lot of churches, in most churches, that, that when, when a church plant is brand new and you're just getting things going and starting things off, it is exciting, it is exhausting, but it's all hands on deck. Like people that, it, I don't, it, there's got to be something a little bit off to join a church plant, Right? <laughs> Because you're saying like, okay, there's no existing ministry structures. We don't even know if this thing is going to go. Um, we don't even know what it's going to look like. But yeah, let's go. Let's do it. And so everybody's in. Everybody's on that, involved. When we moved to D.C. in 2010, we only knew a couple of people here. And we, so we immediately tried to get to know as many people as we could in the city. And so that brings this passion and outward focus and a holy dependence on God to be able to move. And then as the church becomes more established, it's possible to sit back and be a little more comfortable. And so I would love to see somehow for us to recover that holy dependence on God to move and act, giving ourselves first to the Lord, but at a sustainable pace because nobody can live at the pace of a church plan. So that's areas where I would love to see God's grace fulfilled in us. And this comes out in generosity, too. Um, in your books, on one of the pages, you'll find a, a timeline or a graph that looks like this. Now, this is just a, a way to think, because it's hard when we think about generosity and when we think about the way God might call us to give, to think about where we are in a journey and to think, like, some of you have never given to Redemption Hill Church and you've been around a while. That's okay. Maybe God is calling you to engage. Maybe for others, you can consider what God is moving in you. And so for some, you might be an initial giver, somebody who, who decides for the first time to respond to God's word and trust God and the leaders of the church. You might go from initial giving into, and, and grow into a consistent giver, somebody who consistently gives on a regular basis in, in ways that support God's work in his people. For some of you, it's moving from consistent, where it might be set, to being a, for it being a priority, that you understand the preeminence of Christ, and so as you give yourself more fully to the Lord, it drives your spending and saving rather than your own desires of spending and saving driving your giving. You might become a surrendered giver, someone you, who you've surrendered your whole life and said, this is beginning to change me and the way I give, or an eternal giver, someone who sees the eternal impact of giving, and the more that they are led to do good and be generous and ready to share, the more they take hold of that which is truly life, and they keep growing, making all decisions in light of eternal impact. And so wherever you are on the journey, we want to, we want, the, the primary goal we have through this series is that everybody is involved in working through what God has for you, that we would give ourselves first to the Lord. All right, that brings us to our fourth characteristic. So generosity in all circumstances, generosity as discipline, generosity for the completion of grace, and fourth, generosity is a reflection of Christ. And so Paul is careful here. Listen to what he says next. He says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others your, that your love is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he became, I'm sorry, though, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And so he's careful here. He says, this isn't a command. He's not coming at this as a command. And I think that's hard because a lot of us would like clearer rules on this. It would be easier if we said, okay, the way that God calls us to give, if you are a Christian, is to give this amount or this percentage. But even then, we're not satisfied because then we'd be like, okay, pre-tax or post-tax. And so which is it? 
I'm sure that for some of you, you'd like clearer rules, because, but that is rooted in every one of us. We want to have a sense of being able to accomplish our own security and, and know that we've done enough, and, and it's easier to have a checklist, but instead, what Paul gives us here, he says, I don't have a command for you, this is, but, but I'm, I'm saying, look at what others have done, and then he brings it right back to Jesus, <clears throat> which is where we will settle in as we, as we bring our time to completion tonight. And thank God that Christianity is not primarily about rules. Thank God that, that because every one of us would fall short and our hearts wouldn't be changed. But verse 9 is the key to all of this. Because Paul holds up Jesus and he says, this is what generosity looks like ultimately. You can see it in the lives of these Macedonian Christians, but, but look at Christ because we can't be selfish or triumphalistic in light of Christ's work. And, and so, again, I want you to hear this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. One of the clearest evidences of God's grace in someone's life, of the Spirit's work in somebody's life, is that it overflows in generosity through them. And again, that's not just limited to finances, but it includes our money. And, and what we have is this, this clarity that we hear, read in Philippians chapter 2 as well, that, that Jesus emptied himself of the glory of the heavens to take on flesh and live life and be despised and spit on and killed in our place for our sin. And so not only was he rejected by the very people he created, but he took on the fullness of the debt of our sin so that we could be credited with his righteousness. That is the most unfair transaction that has ever hit the books. That he would receive the debt of our sin, it was nailed to the cross, and that we receive his righteousness. He became poor physically, he became poor in his reputation, he became poor in his power and glory, so that we might become rich, so that we might become sons and daughters of God so that we might be invited into God's presence so that we might be filled by the Spirit and promised a place in eternity in, in, in God's presence at the table of the King. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of God's generosity to us that, that is an unfair exchange that is pure grace to us. And it's, again, rooted in God's grace as it had come to the Macedonians in, in verse 1. So that even in severe affliction and poverty, they overflowed with joy and generosity. And so this is the calling to each one of us today. God is to understand who Christ is. Because this shapes us. You know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. See, what that tells every one of you is that, that God sees you, he loves you, and Jesus Christ gave himself up out of his love for you and he offers the gift of his spirit and love of the Father to you. He doesn't want us to respond to his sacrifice partially though, or halfway. He wants all of us. That's the calling. The greatest commandment is that we would love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, that we would love people around us as our own selves. And, and so and he, Jesus calls, he says, if, if you're going to come after me, what it looks like to follow him is to take up our cross daily, that we would lose our life to find life in him, that we would give ourselves first to the Lord. And the promise is his glory and joy, free gifts of God's grace and generosity. And the rest for us is just a response to that. And we give ourselves first to the Lord, meaning that we show generosity in all circumstances as a discipline for the completion of grace and, as, and that it is a reflection of Christ. And so I'm going to ask us to do something as a church this upcoming week. And that is, I want you, I'm going to ask you to join me in memorizing verse 9 so that we can come back next week and recite it. It'll be kind of like a quiz. We'll come back together except it'll probably be on the screen anyway, but don't, don't count on that. I would love for you to join me in memorizing this this week, and actually to get that started, um, I'm, if we could put it back up, I'm gonna ask that we would read it together right now. And so please join me as we read this, because this is the hope that we have tonight. 
For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Let's read it one more time together. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. That's good news, church. Following Jesus changes all of who we are. It is a whole self, all of life calling that has implications on how we live and it will overflow in generosity. Let's pray. Father, would you move in our hearts? Would you bring the completion of your grace to us? Would you help us to trust in the good news of what you've done for us in Jesus? And would you help us to release the need to cling to things in our life for ourselves only, but to, would you move by your spirit to help us overflow with generosity? Lord, we want to be a church that's known to be generous. Would you help us to grow in grace? Would you bring a, f- a fullness of your grace in our church? Would you help us to see what you ha- you're calling us to in this, in this city? And to follow your voice with courage. And so tonight, as we continue this journey together, I pray that that you would help us to make sure not to get things out of order, but to understand that the whole foundation we have is Christ's generosity to us that overflows in our generosity outwardly. Would you free us from from the need to try to earn our way to you, but help us to rest and find peace in your presence. So we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.